Thanks very much for uh, asking me to come speak. Uh, this has been really cool so far, so I hope to live up to the quality of the previous speakers. There have been some great talks. Um, so this was, a, I, I like the videos that uh, they, they picked to introduce this because they sort of give you a real idea of uh, the magnitude of the problem. And if anything, Al Gore, in my opinion, is not being sufficiently alarmist. So I want to talk about what we can do about it. How can, how can we solve the problem of greenhouse gas emission? Uh, and what I want to start with is looking at identifying what the problem is. So here is a plot of greenhouse gas emissions, and I want to take a second to explain uh, uh, what these things mean. This is total greenhouse gas emissions. The size of these bubbles is, for each country in the world, how many greenhouse gas emissions and megatons of CO2 equivalent that every country in the world emits in a given year. And on the horizontal and vertical, I've busted this down into two components, which are basically the two largest components of greenhouse gas emission. On the vertical is how much is emitted by transportation, and on the horizontal is how much is emitted by basically electricity generation and heat. And this is the situation in 1990. The United States stood alone as being by far the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, both in transportation and in electrical generation, followed by the Russian Federation, China, and everybody else in the world sort of lagging well behind like this. What I'm going to show you now is a timeline year by year from 1990 to 2005, which is when this data, which is from the uh, uh, world uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, I can't, Unfortunately, all of my references are blocked off on the bottom, so you'll have to. All of these are sourced on my original slides if you take a look at them. Anyway, so the, the, the data runs out in about 2005 that I had available, but this shows you the, the trends and, and the, the magnitude of the problem that's going on. So here's 1991, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here's the situation in 2000. China had, had boosted itself into number two spot in greenhouse gas emissions. The United States, notice, was staying more or less flat, uh, gaining a little bit, but not really accelerating too much. And now watch, watch what happens to China in five years, from 2000 to 2005. It goes from 1,400 megatons of CO2 equivalent to nearly twice that in five years. And that trend is continuing, largely out of control. The lesson to be gained here is that we're not doing anything about greenhouse gas emission right now. Our, our, our remedies to it have been woefully inadequate to date. So what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? Well, let's look at where all of this greenhouse gas is coming from, OK? The other thing to notice, the two things I want you to take away from this as well, is two countries are the whole problem, the US and China. Everybody else, for all intents and purposes, is irrelevant. If you don't solve the problem in the US and China, you haven't done anything. The second thing is the US and China are different. The US is unique in its, use, in, in its love of the automobile and the airplane. And we, um, alone among countries, uh, have a huge emission of greenhouse gases from our transportation network. China, it's all electricity. And I'll get back to that point in a minute. So here's how this energy is generated. This is energy uh, generation by source. Oh, I can see my references down here. So this is uh, the source is the US Energy Administration information. Uh, U U.S. Energy Information Administration. And China is almost entirely coal, a little bit of oil, and so on. The U.S. has a little bit better mix, but that mostly reflects the fact that we use so much oil in our transportation network. We don't burn coal in our cars, we burn oil. And one thing is, okay, so you want to make electric cars in order to save the world, right? Well, you know, contrary to the way it might appear, electric cars do not run entirely on smugness. You still have to generate the energy for them. And so if we move from gasoline-powered cars to electric cars and don't change our energy mix, we'll start to look a lot more like China. In particular, most of our electric, the, the lion's share of our electricity is made from coal with a little bit from natural gas, nuclear, and uh, uh, renewable coming in forth with almost none of that being oil. So the basic lesson here is that if we are going to attack greenhouse gas emission and tackle climate change, we have to find a replacement for coal. Now, OK. Al Gore gave a, good, uh, uh, gave a good case for why coal is bad for global warming. Coal is bad in a lot of other ways. Coal is dirty, deadly, nasty, and unpleasant. And so we want to quantify this. We want to come up with a measure that just tells us how unsafe a given fuel is. And the measure that I want to use, that I'm going to use in this talk, is deaths per kilowatt hour, deaths per terawatt hour. So how many people do you have to kill to generate one terawatt hour of electricity? Now, I, let me explain the units here. A watt is a rate. It's a rate of energy usage. So a, a, a watt hour, for example, 100 watt hours, for example, would be if you the amount of energy required to run a 100 watt bulb for one hour. 
Okay, so one watt hour is a one watt uh, is running a one watt power drain for for a period of hours. So this is the, the number of people you have to kill for one terawatt hour, which is roughly the amount of energy that the planet uses in our electrical grid, uh, uh, all of human energy used for about four minutes. So in order to power the planet for four minutes, and I would like to caution you, these numbers are very hard to come by and are only approximate. So estimates will vary, but the basic order of magnitude relative of these things is, is pretty much agreed on by most people who do the estimates. So roughly speaking, in order to run the world for four minutes, you have to kill 160 people if you're going to do it with coal. Oil, you only have to kill about 30 people. Okay, and we'll get down to renewables later. But this is a, a nice measure of just how awful coal is, is that uh, most of these deaths are either from mining or air pollution. Okay, so primarily it's the air pollution from coal that is killing all these people. Secondarily, it's people dying in the production of coal because mining is very dangerous. One other statistic that I'd like to point out, which will be relevant later though, is coal, burning of coal releases into the environment every year. The trillions of tons of coal we burn release about 33 kilocuries of radiation, mostly in the form of uranium and thorium into the environment, either in the atmosphere or in those sludge ponds that Al Gore was showing you which is roughly the equivalent amount of radiation if we took all of the uranium that we mined for nuclear power in one year, ground it up into a powder, and dumped it out of the back of trucks. Okay, it's about the same as the, the radiation content of all the uranium mined in the, in the earth in one year, is released in one year of burning coal. Very dangerous stuff. So how are we gonna get out of this? How are we gonna replace coal? And in order to do that, we need two rules. Rule number one is there is no energy shortage. People should not use that term. There's plenty of energy around. World energy consumption is about 16 terawatts. The solar energy incident on the Earth is 174,000 terawatts. About 10,000 times as much solar energy hits the Earth every second as we use. So wind and solar should be enough, right? Well, there's rule number two. Use it or lose it. What do I mean by this? What I mean is, we may not have an energy shortage, but we have an energy storage shortage. World energy consumption is 16 terawatts. Global grid storage capacity, the amount of energy we can save for later, is 127 gigawatts. 0. 0.0000, bunch of zeros, 8%, effectively zero. For all intents and purposes, we cannot store any energy from our grid. It has to be generated at the time of demand. Otherwise, it goes to waste. This is where wind and solar have a problem because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And we can quantify this as well by talking about a, 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 a statistic called capacity factor. What the capacity factor is, is for any given type of power plant, how often is it generate, what percentage of the time is it generating electricity? Capacity factors for coal are in excess of 70%. And this is one of the reasons why we use coal. It's not just because coal is cheap, it's because coal has a high capacity factor, which means it can supply the base load to the grid. Wind and solar, on the other hand, have capacity factors in the range of 20 to 30%. If you want to keep the freezers running at Wegmans 24-7, you can't make your grid out of power plants that are only running 20 to 30% of the time. You have to have a high capacity source to, ma to, to, to match your base load. You're not going to create a reliable grid otherwise. Anyone who's ever been to India knows what it's like to not have the proper capacity factor in your grid. Power goes out all the time, right? So in order to replace coal and to keep a reliable grid, wind and solar just aren't going to cut it completely. They're, they can be a big component of it, but they can't be the whole story because they do not have the ability to run at the capacity factor that you need to meet base load in the grid. So let's look at the alternatives. So now I've zoomed in on the renewable, the, the zero carbon sources of energy that we could possibly use and looked at deaths per kilowatt hour for that. Rooftop solar is dominated primarily by people falling off of roofs when they're installing it, okay? <laughs> Which is remarkably high. <laughs> you, you have to kill a few people, you know, a half a person per terawatt hour just to do that. Wind likewise is construction accidents. What about hydro? Let me give you, this seems awfully high, right, for hydroelectric power. Let me give you an example. In 1975, uh, Typhoon Nina hit China. 171,000 people were killed in dam collapses. 11 million were left homeless. Does anybody remember what the official death toll for Chernobyl was? 59. 
Uh, the IAEA estimates that eventual cancer deaths from radiation release from Cher Chernobyl will be around 4,000, dwarfed by these kind of large accidents in hydroelectric power. Okay, so let's talk about nuclear power then. I'm going to argue that in order to create a reliable grid that is going to emit zero carbon, if you really want to do this and if we're serious about moving far fast, this is the way you're going to get it done. You're going to have a combination of nuclear for your base load, solar and wind to cover the rest of your capacity. There's plenty of capacity in solar and wind, but not the kind of availability that you're going to get from nuclear power. So should we be all that worried about nuclear power? I want to, I want to talk to you about two nuclear technologies, two clean energy technologies involving nuclear power that can save the world and explain to you why we want them and what good they're going to do us. The first one is fast burner reactors, and the second one is thorium fuel cycle. Both of these are closed fuel cycle nuclear technologies. What we have right now is called an open fuel cycle. We mine uranium out of the ground, 50,000 tons of it a year. We process it into slightly enriched reactor uranium. We put it into light water reactors. We burn the stuff, and then we take the fuel out, and we put it into cooling ponds, and eventually probably going to bury it somewhere. Okay, so the fuel is used once, we'd make no effort to, to recover anything out of that and reuse it. There's no recycling that goes on. Fast burner reactors are a way to recycle. So why do we want fast burner reactors? The primary problem with spent fuel from existing nuclear reactors, and there's 63,000 tons of it in the world right now, it is not going away. 78% of it is in storage pools at the reactors themselves. Doing nothing with this stuff is not an option. It's the worst possible thing you can do. We cannot leave it there. There's only two things you're going to do with it. You're going to bury it or you're going to burn it. Fast, uh, uh, fast burner reactors allow you to burn this stuff. The thing that makes this stuff so nasty is not just radioactivity, but a particular kind from things that are called transuranic elements. Transuranic elements are, uh, are atoms heavier than uranium, for example, plutonium. These, the, the, the waste that's left over from open cycle nuclear power has lots and lots of transuranics in it. These are the things that, ha that, won't, uh, that will be radioactive for tens of thousands of years that are, all, that are really the nasty part of the problem. Fast burner reactors allow you to burn transuranics as fuel. This is a variation on a well-known well technology called fast breeders. All you do with a fast burner is you run a breeder at below unity capacity so that you're net burning up all of this stuff. This top graph is a projection out to the year 2108 of the, uh, the number of tons of spent nuclear fuel that we're going to have to dispose of if we continue to use light water reactors as we do now. The green curve is the equivalent tonnage if we move to fast breeder reactors to burn up this waste. Not only will there be a lot less of that waste, it will be a lot cleaner. The bottom uh, plot is the content of these transuranics, these really nasty elements in the waste, projected up to the year 2100. The black line is if we use open cycle reactors. The green line is what you will get for the content of transuranics in this stuff if you use fast burner reactors. So number one, if we implement fast burner technology, we can actually take the, the nuclear waste that we have, burn it for energy, and we kill two birds with one stone. We get clean electric power generation, and we get rid of all this nasty nuclear waste. Technology number two is thorium cycle reactors. These operate not on uranium, but on another even more abundant element in the, uh, uh, in the Earth's crust called thorium. Thorium is about four times the abundance of uranium, and it's 100 times the efficiency. Uranium, natural uranium, is only about 1% fissile. Thorium, on the other hand, can be entirely converted into energy. All the atoms in this thing are usable. Furthermore, it's a lot safer. Thorium is not itself a fissile material. It's fertile, which means that when it absorbs a neutron, it turns, in, turns into fissile uranium-233. So you're, you're actually creating the uranium that you're going to burn for energy in the reactor as you do it by bombarding the thorium with, ne with neutrons. So in particular, this stuff is very safe. You can hold it in your hands. And it also means that the, the, that the reactor is dynamically stable. If you cut off all the power, like happened in Fukushima, what happens is the reaction just stops because it has to be continuously fed in order for the reaction to take place. Furthermore, the waste products of thorium reactors are considerably safer. No, if, for all intents and purposes, there are no transuranics produced, very small amounts anyway. 
And then what's remaining, the radioactive wastes, are, are, are lighter elements than uranium. And these are things that are radioactive, but they decay, in a few, they decay to safe levels in a few hundred years rather than tens of thousands. So the waste management of waste from thorium reactors is orders of magnitude better than you have from light water uranium reactors. And finally, it has no proliferation issues with it to speak of. It's very impractical for weapons production. It's very hard to use this to, to, to get enough isotopes to build an atomic bomb. So I want to close by this, which luckily for me was a paper that came out on Wednesday. Uh, it was actually, so it was approved for publication in Environmental Science and Technology this week. And this is a, uh, a paper by James Hansen, is a name you might recognize, is a leading climate change researcher. Um, and they, uh, they, what they did was they estimate how many air pollution related deaths had been prevented by nuclear power to date and estimated how many could be prevented in the future. And so I've highlighted this. Nuclear power has so far historically in their estimate prevented about 1.84 million pollution-related deaths and 64 gigatons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emissions. And by mid-century, nuclear power could prevent an additional 420,000 to 7.04 million deaths and 80 to 240 gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions from fossil fuels. So my message to you today is you should change your mind about nuclear power if you really want to, uh, if you really want to be an environmentalist. Thank you very much.